Okay, so hello everyone and welcome to another ICTS virtual string seminar. Today we are happy to have Chetan from IAC with us and he's going to talk to us about the information paradox. Over to you, Chetan. Okay, so uh, thanks for the invitation. And uh, so I know that the number of slides is a little too much, but uh, towards the end of the thing, I think um, there are a bunch of slides which are somewhat superfluous. So hopefully it won't be too painful. Uh, I am large. Sorry, was that a question? Okay, so so there was uh, so the, I'm mostly going to talk about this paper with uh, Vaishnav, who is my undergraduate slash master student who is applying for PhD now. And I should really emphasize that this uh, the main uh, so that will be what the most of the talk will be about. And uh, it's uh, so V2 of this has become the JHEP version, but I think put out the V3 which I think is better than the V2 because there is like, I think our assumptions are somewhat slightly more relaxed and uh, we have a more general statement and all that. So, uh, so, but the V3 is now up on the archive. So if you take a look at the paper, maybe- Sorry, just one second, Chetan. I think there's some background. So could you please uh, mute, uh, in particular, so you have to mute themselves, please. Or maybe Vishal, if you could just mute all, I think that I see a lot of people who are muted. Yeah. I think you have the power to mute all. Yeah, sure. Yeah, Chetan, you can continue. Yeah. Just so, um, so I was just saying that. Um, so the uh, so we put out just the V3 of the uh, of this paper very you know yesterday basically, uh, and the published version is V2, which I am not so happy with as the V3. So if you are looking at it, don't look at the published version as much as the as the archive version. Okay. So and but I will also you know since uh, Subhat is in the audience and there has been some discussion about gravitating bats and all that, so we'll also discuss for a fairly lengthy, maybe 20 slides, right? Uh, 20 or 15 slide digression on this question of gravitating bath stif stuff. And uh, I'll try to put it in the early parts when people still have some energy. And, uh, but even though my real focus, sorry, my real focus is uh, on this paper today. Okay, so, uh, so yeah, so let me start with some general, uh, general statements about information paradox. So there are many questions of increasing subtlety which go by this phrase of information paradox and uh, Hawking's original version can be viewed as some sort of an imprecise statement about loss of unitarity during evaporation of black hole and it's not very clear whether it is really a contradiction. Uh, uh, so the rough idea is that a black hole radiates as though it were an exact thermal state. So it becomes difficult to understand what happened to the detailed information of the initial quantum state that collapsed to form the black hole. So this is Sort of the sort of the very hand wavy version of the information paradox, um, and this problem must have a solution if ADS CFT is true, because the CFT is unitary. So this is something that the or, or holography is true, and if your your dual theory is expected to be unitary, then you expect that this has some kind of a, a resolution. To but, but to what extent and how to understand these questions from the bulk is something that is not immediately clarified by ADS CFT. And the reason for that is that implicit in Hawking's semi-classical calculation is this picture that the black hole is a bulk localized system in flat space or ADS. So if it's a small black hole, for example. And uh, bulk locality questions are not easy to ask in holography because the true diff invariant observables are integrals of all over, over the entire space time. And therefore we have, they have support only at the boundary. Okay, so this is uh, so this is this. These are the natural observables of uh, of holography, which you really see only at infinity. So how do you talk about bulk localized stuff? And this is one question that one can ask. So and by the way, at any point, if you have any questions, please stop and interrupt, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I can't really uh, see you. See if somebody raises a hand. So uh, just just interrupt. All right. So uh, yeah. So one can elevate. <laughs> Was that a question? No, okay, there was some other. Okay, so one can elevate Hawking's implicit assumption that black holes are localized objects into an explicit assumption. In, in somewhat fancier language, you could say that we split the Hilbert space into two possible tensor factors and imagine that the black hole is living in one. So this is, this is, the, this is the setting in which Hawking would have imagined his calculation to be done. And um, to, so then one can ask, ask more generally how the entanglement entropy, so if you allow such a tensor factorization, then you can ask a more general question, forgetting about black holes and all that, how the entanglement entropy of a subsystem should evolve if degrees of freedom are steadily leading the subsystem into the rest of the system. This will be sort of the crudest possible model for Hawking radiation. Okay, so that's our, uh, this. 
Uh, this result is interesting because the overall sh shape of this page curve is very general. And it relies only on our assumption that the system contains two pieces and that it is quantum mechanical. And there is some minor assumptions about the gener genericity of the state on the question, which won't matter too much for us. So, but it differs from the Hawking result because its calculation is predicated on the horizon being smooth throughout. So in Hawking's calculation, the, there is no structure. The, the radiation is sort of coming out at all times from a smooth horizon. So, and it's always ex exactly thermal, very at least in uh, some way of doing this, making the statement. So there's apparently no information about going radiation. And so because of which Hawking would predict that your um, radiation should go like this, Hawking or at least Page's version of Hawking's paradox would be that um, your entanglement entropy would basically just go up like this. Uh, but here on the other hand, uh, for a generic system, which allows tensor factorization, you expect that there should be a turnaround of this form. And this is basically the page curve. So this, so in order to reproduce this, so, so the page curve brings out a more detailed manifestation of the violation of unitarity by emphasizing Hawking's uh, implicit assumption that black holes can be localized in the body. And this is useful because we now have a curve to shoot for and not just a yes, no statement about unitarity. And if you're trying to resolve it, then we are trying to resolve the information paradox. And equally importantly, at the page time, so that when this happens, this turnaround happens, if the black hole is a macroscopic black hole, this is still the, the, the size of the horizon. The curvature scales are extremely small. So we expect that uh, this is a place where, um, you know, uh, it, it's, the contradiction is happening at a, in a regime where we do not expect serious quantum gravity or high curvature effects to be of significance. So this is in some sense a much sharper version of the paradox than Hawking ever had. So, and that's one reason why it is an interesting way to phrase the question. Okay, so um, operationally, the difference between Hawking's ex expectation and Page's curve happens because Hawking's version of the entropy calculation treats the entanglement entropy as entirely due to the entropy between ingoing and outgoing QFT modes in this background, black hole background. And uh, so half of it falls in, the other half goes out. And this can only relentlessly increase as more and modes are, more, uh, modes are emitted because the emission is always happening, as I said, from a smooth structureless horizon. So, and it's basically the same entanglement that you would see in the in, in Minkowski space or flat space or whatever. So, and this entanglement entropy is sometimes denoted by S bulk. Okay, so I'm kind of giving you a general overview of the context of the recent developments. And this is kind of like, you know, in the next, uh, hopefully in the next two, three slides or four slides, I will kind of switch gears and go into something that is uh, more interesting. But so, yeah, I'm sure that many of you have heard much of this a lot of times, but uh, so I kind of needed to kind of set up the context of what I'm going to talk about. So the key point is that if you just compute, if, you, if your entanglement entropy is uh, just uh, coming from this S bulk contribution, which is from the entanglement of the quantum field theory modes that are leaving the system, then one can think of S bulk as the entanglement entropy of the, uh, uh, yeah, so this is just what I said. So, and uh, so this is, this is what, this can only run <laughs> because of this feature that uh, the, the, you know, you, this entanglement is just relentlessly going to increase because half of the modes are going inside and half of the modes are leaving. So the question is, instead of attributing the entanglement entropy to just this S bulk, so, and this is the place where the new inputs have come in in the last couple of years, is that instead of treating S bulk as the entire contribution, can we have some sort of a reasonable modification of that S bulk as the reasonable modification, uh, modified prescription for the entanglement entropy, which corrects S bulk in some way. Okay, so this is, uh, and the recent developments can be viewed as the observation that there is a very natural way to do this. And uh, this you can kind of motivate. In fact, it is a little bit surprising that people never thought of it for the last 20, 25 years, or maybe even 30 years. I don't know when Beckenstein stuff was. So, uh, so, so the so I think Beckenstein was 1973 or something. So, uh, so that basically means that um, this old idea. So Beckenstein had this old idea that entropy of the quantum fields needs, in addition to the standard uh, thermodynamics of matter, you also have to add the 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 area by four GPs in order to make second law of thermodynamics safe from black holes. So this is something that he had already suggested long ago, which means that it is natural to think that the natural entropy that one might have to worry about in the context of even Hawking evaporation is not just S bulk, but S bulk plus some correction, which is proportional to the area of the black hole divided by four GPs. And the formalization of this is what leads to the notion of a quantum extremist. Okay, so this, uh, 
I won't have too much to say about it. I mean, even though in some of our papers we use it. So, um, so, so, but the point, rough point is that uh, instead of treating S bulk as the only contribution to the entanglement entropy of the evaporating black hole, what one does is we correct it by some A by 4G. But note that this correction, even though it is supposed to, you call it a correction, it's a massive correction because it contains a one over G. So it scales like some power of N. So it's a huge correction to the thing. And the idea is that, so the dominance between these two pieces switches uh, at the page time in your page curve. And because of which you can have uh, this early part gives rise to the rising part of the page curve and this lowering part, uh, this part gives rise to the falling part of the page curve, uh, depending on, uh, you know, before and after the page time. And so there is, there is some possibility of a phase transition between these two uh, entities. And that's what gives rise to the correct page curve is the way to understand these recent developments. So I'm not, I'm, I'm being very sketchy and, uh, you know, uh, vague here, but uh, that's kind of enough for my purposes here. So the key point is that there is an extra piece that is being added and there is a trade-off between these two pieces and that trade-off is precisely what is required in order for us to get the right form of the page curve. Okay. Sorry, Ajitana, are you going to speak about yeah. the factorization now or uh, is that I'll, I'll, I'm talking, I'll talk about it probably in the next, 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 uh, let's say five, 10 slides. So I okay, won't really sure. have too much to say about factorization issue very directly. What I will talk about is, uh, yeah, you'll see what I talk about. So I'm talking about like some sort of uh, building, uh, you know, evidence for uh, the kind of uh, the kind of calculations that Gibbons and Hawking have been doing and stuff like that. So that's okay, you'll so see. Th th then I should just say maybe one thing. I mean, the formula that yeah. you gave before is presented as a very general formula, but really the yeah. only place it's really understood is when you have ADS CFT and you know this this uh, S gen is like measuring the entropy of some non gravitational region. And that's also where it's used for the eye lymph description, right? We don't have any evidence as far as I know that this kind of formula is precise so think, in some correct the, sense for a gravitational Right. I, yeah, I we, think we that, can discuss it more, but yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I think the question of what exactly this entropy is computed. So for instance, one of the good things about something like a doubly holographic prescription is that I, I think it uh, suggests natural generalizations of this prescription, which are valid there. And because of which I think that one can construct, you know, one can use um, uh, definitions of this quantity where we don't know what exactly is being computed, but it is, it tells us, uh, you know, it's, it's a, it, there are natural plausible generalizations of this thing, which might work even in the context of gravity when gravity is. So that's okay, the way. So in I, that case, it's the right-hand side that's well-defined and the left-hand side may not be a phenomenon. Yeah, I'm going to use a, a, you know, doubly holographic thing. So in, in that sense, this particular split is, it just gives me an RP formula, basically. Okay, fine. So yeah, so this here, so yeah, so this is the, um, sorry. So this is the uh, entanglement entropy of the boundary computed using this QES prescription. Yeah, this is what I just said. And these, this was the development of uh, these guys uh, in the last couple of years. And this is sometimes called the island prescription. And uh, in my picture, some of the pictures, you will see why it is uh, sort of reasonable to call it an island. Um, and that's the, so now we are going to talk about the thing that Surat was talking about, which is, so, so this is, I think the, for the next 15, 20 slides, I think I'll talk about this, uh, some of the questions related to this. And this is the part which I expect to be controversial. After that, I don't think there'll be much controversy if we get that far. So yes, so the first puzzle, and this is a digression from my uh, main theme for the talk, is that many of the calculations of this type are usually done in a setting where we have an ADS black hole that is coupled to a non-gravitating sink or map. And what happens if we have gravity in the sink, like in the case of this evaporating black hole, where if you have radiation leaving the system, or if you have a flat space black hole, I put the flat space in uh, quotes, because if you hold the flat space black hole at fixed temperature, like a lot of people do in some of these calculations, you actually have to worry about the uh, worry about the back reaction of this heat path at infinity. And I don't really know many papers which do this in a systematic way. I have made some efforts in that direction in this paper, which I will tell you a little bit about. But in many of the papers that people talk about where they keep the flat space black hole at, uh, at uh, uh, you know, apparently at fixed temperature at infinity, uh, they don't seem to worry about the back reaction of the, uh, the heat path. Because, they, but this is, because it's flat space, gravity is never it's still there. It's not like the case of ADS plus sink. So there is a, there is really a back reaction that you have to worry about. And uh, I will also tell you why I think their calculations actually give rise to the right answer or, or the fact that they seem to be able to resolve certain information paradoxes. And I'll tell you why by looking at this, uh, 
this uh, doubly holographic type of setup that I work with, you can kind of see why is it that it is not unreasonable that they get the right answer even though they are doing some sort of a weird thing there. So, so yeah, so that's the reason why I'm putting flat space here in parentheses. Another way of saying the same thing is that, uh, you know, the, the hardle hawking state of a flat space black hole, it is known to be unstable. So this is a, a theorem, you know, some QFT encode space type of theorem, which I've never actually looked at the proof of, but uh, it's from K and Wald, so one can probably trust, trust it. So there is this general statement that these, and it's reasonable because it's just the fact that when you black hole radiates, you know, its temperature is going to rise, so it's not an equilibrium. That's really what it's all saying. So it's a completely reasonable statement that these things are not stable. So, but anyway, so, 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 so the statement is that, so these are, uh, you know, two places where I would say that, so in many, many of the discussions in this context are in the context of one plus one dimensions, where I think it is not really very clear cut uh, separation between a dynamical graviton or graviton has how much, um, you know, how much juice does a graviton has is not very clear. But I think these two papers, which kind of uh, uh, address things in high enough dimensions, but the price that you kind of have to pay is that uh, in order to talk about uh, uh, the page curve to emerge in these settings, we have to assume that we can isolate the black hole within a cutoff in some suitable sense, even though it is a bulk localized object. And this is sometimes called the central dogma. And uh, you know, in Maldacena's review, he presents various arguments why it is reasonable, why it is, uh, um, you know, maybe it is not so, uh, it's, it's, you can kind of think of it in terms of the old calculation of Gibbons Hawking, which is that, you, you know, when you, when you put a cutoff in, uh, in flat space and compute, ent ent uh, com compute entropies or uh, free energies, you seem to be getting reasonable results. But there is one caveat here, which is that these statements are cutoffs in Lorentzian flat space. So, which is a different thing in both these, both in our paper as well as here, what they really need is a Lorentzian flat space because information paradox is really a Lorentzian question. But nonetheless, so this is one justification that one might think of as, uh, uh, you know, as a reasonable way, or as a reasonable starting point for some of these things. And I'll have some more to say about it, but I don't think that any of those things will be uh, too convincing for a, uh, with the hardened skeptic. But uh, so, so I'll, I'll say uh, uh, some more, one more comment about why I think it is reasonable for putting a cutoff in flat space around a black hole is maybe a reasonable thing. But uh, there are some more, some concrete calculations, some more concrete calculations that one can do using doubly holographic setups, which is what I think I will emphasize in the next few slides before coming back to this point again. Um, so yeah, so uh, criticism, uh, further criticism that has been raised by Geng and Karch against this ADS plus sync systems is that these systems contain massive gravitons. And at the limit when the mass of the graviton goes to zero, the islands also go away. This I find to be extremely unconvincing. And uh, one reason for that is that what this note this happens because there are settings in these settings where um, so by the way so these uh, you know so if you are not familiar with this uh, double double holography type of settings uh, I can just show you one quick slide here so uh, so you can just forget about uh, this extra stuff that is sitting here you just think of this as this is one brain uh, and uh, this is some kind of uh, this this is an ADS uh, radial direction and you are basically thinking of a black hole that is living on this brain here. So if you have not seen that at all, I mean, I, I don't know how much of, uh, uh, you know, it's like it's, uh, so feel free to ask questions if, uh, if some of you are not familiar with the setting, but I, you might, I think I saw some talks by um, uh, Andres, which were on this topic here. So that's why I'm kind of assuming some of these settings uh, in this talk. So, so the basic idea being that you have a, a, a brain's living at an angle and there's a horizon on this brain. And then you, uh, so in the original settings where you have, uh, ADS coupled to an uh, coupled to a non-gravitating bath, you basically just have so the, the second brain is not there, and you just have some stuff that is sitting here. So you know you basically send this uh, the anchoring surfaces. Sorry, so the anchoring surface starts from here and falls somewhere here. So and the claim is that when you have a brain at an angle and then there is a sink here, the system necessarily is what is called uh, uh, you know the system is basically what is called a karst randall uh, set up. And in Karst Randall, you basically have a, a, a massless, sorry, a massive graviton. And the claim of this gentleman was that when the angle of the brain goes to zero, you basically end up finding that the graviton mass goes to zero and also the island goes away. So, but I find, as I was saying, the reason why I find that not very compelling is because there is only a single parameter of the problem, which is the angle of the brain. And when the angle goes to zero, gravity also turns off. So there is no real reason to expect that there should have been an island or any kind of uh, real black hole physics at all. So, 
in fact um, so so the one of the things that i did in this uh, in the second paper is that if uh, it's 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 it, it is that if one works with randall sundaram brains instead of karts randall brains then the g neutron can actually be kept finite while having massless random noise so essentially what you need is that if you have a so the infinite volume yeah so i mean let me not get into too much technicalities so uh, so so this is this just happens to be true for uh, randall sundaram brains instead of karts randall and so so the an island compatible doubly holographic rt sur surface so as we are identified in this using an analytic black funnel that is known in ads3 so so the so, so, so the thing is that so if you are working with so the, the 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 trouble in some sense is that plain world so so the so let me just show you a picture of what schematically this looks like so you have an so the this is an ads picture here so instead of the cars randall brain that i had what i now have is basically a black funnel of this type okay so and then there is a brain world that is sitting here so this is the brain world and the schematic picture is basically that if i start with an anchoring surface here i end up finding an island that is anchored here on the brain so this is what so the non trivial question is whether there exists these horizon straddling anchoring surfaces in these uh, geometries so of course in high enough dimensions this is a very difficult problem and the reason why it's a very difficult problem is because you have multiple issues one is nobody has really been able to construct you know in uh, these black funnel solutions in uh, high enough dimensions and the, i mean they have been able to construct only numerically high, these uh, 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 these black funnel solutions and on top of it you also have this problem that you have to construct a brain world uh, on this so this uh, this thing that i drew here so this thing that i drew here you have to draw a brain world you have to also construct a brain world solution in these geometries so these things in various similar contexts have actually been constructed before but not specifically for the context that we have and a second Sorry. complication here is that when you have a, a funnel horizon like this here when you put a brain world here this brain world has to necessarily move so that it doesn't fall into the black hole so and this is why this is a brain world cosmology this is a standard construction but the point is that because of this funnel uh, horizon that is sitting here this uh, constructing this in the case of uh, uh, in a, in a black funnel geometry would be uh, would be a lot of work so people have constructed black funnel solutions numerically in higher dimensions but i don't think they have put in uh, brain world uh, brain world solutions of this type where there are black black holes on the brain world on a funnel so that's a technical challenge for generalizing this to higher dimensions but the thing that you can show luckily in in ads3 is that in ads3 there is a toy analytic black funnel that exists where you don't have to worry about solving these complicated pdes and you can just construct uh, this uh, you can you can you can construct the rt surfaces that correspond to uh, the surfaces and you can see that there are these horizon straddling uh, so can i can i interrupt the question uh, sure yeah Yeah, so you know the the Gengen Karch argument is actually quite. I mean, I think it's correct. Right? So I I didn't understand why you said it's not. Sorry, can, sorry, sorry, sorry. Can you repeat? Uh, sorry. Yeah, I so was saying that. There is a volume the, uh, issue. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Can, can you hear me now clearly? Yeah. So uh, yeah, I yeah, can okay. hear you. Yeah, I was saying the Gengen Karch argument is very simple. So maybe I can I can just restate it also for the the audience. Yeah. yeah. Argument is just that you know in these setups that have been used, you take some theory which has gravity and you couple it to a non-gravitational path. Yeah. And when one does that, uh, you know, the this the theory of gravity that people consider is actually always has an asymptotically EDS region, and so there's yeah. a stress tensor on the boundary of that. And when you couple yeah, it to yeah, a bar, yeah, that's just that, yeah. yeah, I know, I know, I know, you know about that. I'm just saying it mm -hmm. just so everyone's on the same page. So you yeah. know, when you couple it to the bar, the stress tensor ceases to be conserved, and so it picks up in a normalized dimension, and that's why you get a mass. But you know, th this construction of having a, a factorized Hilbert space necessarily requires you to take a stress tensor and couple it to something else, right? So it seems you know it's true that in the paper they had a specific demonstration by looking at an angle, but it's it seems specific to be much more general. Specific demonstration of what? I mean, you're right that in the paper the claim they made, which is that you know when the mass goes away, the islands goes away, was made as a function of just one angle. But you see, mm -hmm. you could make a more general argument, which is that look, the moment you take a system which has gravity, couple it to something which doesn't have gravity, yeah, you're, you're bound so, to get something which is which right. is massive. So right? so, so but see, see the point is that the around. place where I'm anchoring the uh, anchoring my uh, in in all these constructions, the place where I'm anchoring this thing, this is not completely, this is not a factorized system, right? So this is again, this I am anchoring it at a place where there is still gravity. So I I right. would say that the fact that you're calculating, you're doing a calculation in a setting where you sort of um, you know, 
where it is where this sort of a boundary condition is allowed by the brain world, brain world problem and you're able to get an rt circle then i think it is still a reasonable result but you know in this oh. setup now you'd have another subtlety which is that you know i mean uh, first yeah, yeah you said you said uh, in this setup you would now have another subtlety which is you'd have to worry about the factorization of the hilbert space in the presence of gravity right so gain so the, cartridge so just saying in the place where you see so the factorization of the hilbert space i think in the bulk at this stage i think it is a somewhat premature question because the uh, the problem is that the way i see it so you know in the bulk we have bulk gauge invariance so if you want to look at uh, so you know if you if you look at the fully gauge invariant hilbert space of holography you will only find it at infinity and that i think is uh, you know we all agree about that but the question is whether exists there exists some um, uh, you know interesting um bulk local observables that one can define for the question of information paradox in the bulk i think it is a separate question so the fact that one establishes that there are observables of uh, holography are always at the boundary i think it is studiously avoids this particular question whether there does it where whether there exists bulk local observables which are of interest for understanding a bulk formulation of the information paradox no so no the what you're asking is question. are there Yeah, but what you're asking is are there observables that exist for the page curve? You see, it could be the page curve is not so, relevant. Sorry, so, so, so again, again, the volume. The issue. question you're asking is are there observables that exist for the page curve? It could be the page curve is just not relevant when gravity is dynamic, right? It could be the page curve is a wrong answer we have by thinking about non-gravitational systems. I, I would say that for instance, for the information for, I think that I think there is a question of. Uh, so I think if you if you're talking about fully fine-grained observables, there is no page curve. It's it's a it's a flat page curve. I agree with you. But what I'm saying is that for bulk observations, I'm not sure that the only only uh, observables that one should have access to are the boundary observables. I think okay. there could be approximate observables in the bulk, which actually are meaningful for the question of understanding the page curve. Okay, let me just ask started. one question here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just as uh, we can argue about this later after talk. In, yeah. in this calculation you present, are you just computing a minimal surface and just assuming that the minimal surface makes sense? And is that the computation that one is doing? So you're saying you have this so, brain world; it, it has a massless graviton. We just compute a minimal surface by anchoring it to two points, and we won't worry about what, how we specify the position of the anchor and so on. Um, so, for instance, so 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 this is okay. So there's a couple of questions here. One is that, for instance, if I anchor it here, so one of the reasons why I don't like the ADS three calculation so much, and I would really like to see a higher dimensional calculation, is because of the fact that in the case of ADS three, this funnel. this uh, you know this uh, central thing that you see here it becomes kind of like a very simple thing in some you know it basically just collapses into one basically like a line it's a horizon but it's kind of like a trivial horizon in a way so what you end up finding is that and in 1 plus 1 dimensions you know like if you put a brain world it is not completely clear what is the most natural kind of brain world that one should put there there are multiple choices for the brain world um, um, you know actions that you can choose and so on and so forth so it's not super interesting so the thing that i was most interested in was the fact that you could find these horizon straddling extremal surfaces but i actually do not think that in higher dimensions i i strongly suspect that in higher dimensions also there should exist surfaces of this kind which actually do land on both sides no, of these things that that's not the question the question is how do you how do you determine the end points of the surface how do you specify the end points of the surface because you are in a region which has dynamic gravity um, Yeah, I mean, basically, just from the usual normal boundary conditions on this thing, for example. Here, it will be a normal boundary condition. No, I'm not. But this is a gauge invariant. But I mean, uh, you know, this is a region which has dynamical gravity, right? So you have difficulty in yeah. saying that we specify this point x zero. So I'm yeah, trying so to understand this, how we yeah, get there. Yeah, so this is the same question, right? This is the same question about whether you know whether. So, so what I would say again, I will answer this in uh, in uh, in in one way in the in the context of your wedge holography thing. So I'll actually say something okay. about that when I get. Okay. Okay. So, but so the point is, at the end of the day, I think that. Uh, If you buy, declare by fiat that you cannot localize, uh, uh, you know, these anchoring surfaces anywhere on the bulk, so then I think that then there is nothing to be said. So then uh, that's an answer by fiat, as far as I'm concerned. No, it's not an answer by fiat. It's the fact that the, you can't. I mean, you need a diffeomorphism way of specifying a point, right? It's not that. Yeah, you, but on the other you, hand, we do, do, you know, for instance, if you have empty ADS or something like that, we do talk about uh, bulk local observables by connecting things from the boundary and so on and so forth. Right, right. so and there you is can make sense of, for. So there is always a possibility of it is not it's simply not the case that we don't have bulk observables at all in ADS CFT. So it what you know so the statement that there exists uh, observables the true observables are at, at at the boundary is I think a slightly different question from where the question of whether there exists approximate bulk observables in the bulk and that's I think the question that I think is much more difficult to answer. 
So anyway, so let me get there. I think I think you will, uh, you know, we'll I'll address kind of the things that you're talking about now. So yeah, so that was it. Right. So uh, yeah, so this is where I'm saying that in higher dimensions we would expect that such solutions, um, uh, you know. Um, uh, may exist even in higher dimensions. So, but it would be nice to see that explicitly done. But the trouble is that these are, um, you know, cosmological space times. Cos the brain brain is moving necessarily, and because of which the brain world is the cosmological brain world. And so you have to, uh, you have to, you know, the construction is obviously requires solving some PDEs. So, um, yeah. So, but one interesting circumstantial piece of evidence that you can see from the underlying ads CFT geometry of this black funnel is that the island would compute the co-moving entanglement entropy. This I find actually to be a, quite an interesting fact. And this kind of came up as in some correspondence with uh, Andres. So Andres was the first person to ask this question to me. And uh, in the processes, that's when I realized that this is a very interesting fact that happens. So this is precisely the entropy that keeps track of the black hole information. Because it is, you know, with, without getting corrupted by the modes that become accessible due to the cosmological redshift. So, and uh, so, yeah, so it's, it's, it's also consistent with the fact that these RT surfaces that I'm drawing here are fundamentally the RT surfaces of the underlying ADS, geome ADS CFT geometry and not so much tied to the specific brain world embedding that I'm doing here. So that's a somewhat technical comment, but I can elaborate it as you, if you have questions. So no, the, the, the fact that the brain is moving and we are living in a cosmology, these are basically cosmological islands. And uh, this is this, the fact that what this, this object computes is co-moving and time entropy, it very naturally, if you just follow the, uh, the prescription of the thing, I find it to be quite, quite in some sense satisfying because it really just only keeps track of the black hole information and not the modes that uh, become accessible to the entanglement entropy because of the red shifting. Note that, because as I said, I, I emphasized this once before, the brain has to move. Otherwise, you know, in all these uh, funnel horizon setups, the brain has to move. And when the brain moves, and this is what is the standard construction of a brain world cosmology, and uh, those, uh, and there, the, you know, whenever there is cosmology, you always have red shifting and all that. So you can, uh, you can end up capturing modes that, um, uh, become you know accessible due to the red shifting cosmological red shifting which we would like to avoid and that's precisely what one um, what happens here okay so so yeah so another thing is that i strongly suspect that this underlying co-moving result is the reason why some earlier papers in one plus one dimensions but due to torlacius and isuka and also in higher dimensions uh, where the back reaction of the heat bath was ignored in flat space came to the correct conclusion that islands can resolve the pattern so these guys what they did was they looked at eternal black holes in flat space, but they took the, so the system to be at finite temperature, but they did not worry about the back reaction of the finite temperature bath at infinity. And then they found that, uh, you know, so, but if you just naively do this calculation of a, the kind of uh, calculation that Mahajan and Maldasena and company have done, uh, Almighty have done, and then you find that you can actually resolve the paradox. But I, so I was never very compelled by these calculations because of this fact that the, 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 the temperature, you know, the temperature at infinity has to be taken care of in flat space. But I believe the correct calculation is best done in a doubly holographic setting. And it is because of the fact that the underlying co-moving result is still valid. And that's the reason why these calculations give you the correct result. So in some sense, it kind of indicates the early results of these people. Um, but I think it is best to do it in, uh, in this doubly holographic thing. So, so yeah, so that's what I'll say about this, uh, this, uh, this uh, cosmological brain world stuff. Now I'll talk about the paper of Surat and uh, all these uh, all these people, uh, Karch and I think Randall is there somewhere. Maybe some other people. Surat is there somewhere. So, so this this is the paper that I'll talk about a little bit. And this is the work that you know. So this is uh, this paper is uh, in collaboration with Kaushik, uh, who's our student, uh, who's our uh, student who's graduating now. So in ISE. So they have. Uh, yeah, and I forgot to mention that um, this, uh, some of these, are, you know, one of the, my first paper on this was written with uh, Jude. Jude is also in the audience. And I think that, uh, yeah, so that is one of the first papers that we started off on this. Okay, so, right. So, 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 the, so the basic idea here is that instead of having just one Karst Randall brain in a wedge holography setup, uh, uh, the, it, it, these, these, these authors, they basically adopt a, a two uh, brains. And this is the picture that I drew here. So this is one brain here and one brain here. And if you have two such brains, the advantage is, uh, there are multiple advantages. And uh, um, so, 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 and then there is this black string horizon that interpolates between the two brains, which is what I'm drawing like this here. 
Okay, so this is the black string horizon that is connecting between this end to this end. So, uh, and that's the setup. And so essentially there is two brains, it's an ADS wedge. So, okay, so just to give you an overview for the people who have not seen this. So this is, uh, so this is an AD, this is an ADS a slice of ADS geometry. There is one brain here, one brain here, and then there is a horizon that is sitting here. Okay, so this entire thing is connected by a horizon. So that's what I'm calling the black string horizon, and that is an old paper by uh, Chamblin and uh, uh, Karch. So, which is kind of an interesting setup. So, and uh, this is sometimes called wedge holography, and you can see that there is a preferred point in sitting here, and this is what I'll call the vertex or the defect. Okay, and the interesting thing about this is that because of the presence of the two brains, now again we have massless gravitons in the spectrum. So this is some sort of a more controlled. So, there's some it. there's some lag, I think, because uh, oh, in your sorry. slides in the. Uh, um, so, but I think it was also because I was flashing a little bit. I was going. Uh, can you see my slides now? Right can now, you you're on even better setting for trying out uh, some of these. Is that the slide you're on as well? That's what we. Uh, I am on slide twenty-one now. Yeah, yeah, we see that. Yeah, okay, so I was going back and forth between a few slides a little quickly. Maybe that's where there was a lag. So okay, so um, so and we have a black string horizon that interpolates between the two brains, and uh, this is a nice setup. And one advantage here is that it lets us solve ODs instead of PDs, and that's the thing that I really like about the setup. And because you know, so in the case of the thing that I was looking at before, you really have once you go to higher dimensions, things are hopeless. But partly because of this fact that you have this time-dependent background. And also because you have to construct this brain world on it, and it's just uh, you know there is a black the the black funnel itself has to be constructed numerically. Okay, that has been constructed by hardworking people like uh, you know uh, uh, various people. So and uh, uh, but on the other hand, then you also have to construct a brain world on top of it, which is already hopeless. And then you have to construct RT surfaces on it. So these are all like at least two or three layers of numerical relativity built on top of each other. But this prob problem kind of simplifies things quite a bit. Because what it does is that because of the structure and the symmetry of the system, you just have to solve an ODE to solve it. So, and we don't have to, uh, yeah, so that's one advantage of the setup and, oh, and while keeping the graviton massless. So this is the good thing about it. So, um, so we don't have to solve time dependent PDs like would be required in the higher dimensional generalization of the thing that I was looking at before. But the disadvantage is that the bath is also a black hole. And so it is quite different from the gravitating sinks slash baths one expects in say the asymptotic regions of flat space black holes. Okay, so the asymptotic region of this ADS wedge is at this defect that I showed you in the picture, which is in the middle of the physical brain bath brain system. So extracting general lessons from the system requires some care. So what, uh, uh, what these authors do is that they, they adopt the point of view that because of the dynamical nature of gravity on the bath brain, one should not anchor the RT art surface anywhere specific on the bath. So this is what they uh, adopt as their philosophy. And when you search for an RT surface on a compact geometry without anchoring it anywhere, it'll straddle the bulk horizon. So what I mean by that is that, let's, you know, let's forget about all these curves that I have here, which are basically from our paper. But if you just have these two brains, and let's say that you just, uh, uh, just have Neumann boundary conditions here and here, uh, in this uh, for a for a for a brain for a for an RT surface, and then you try to find the extremal surface, you will find that this will actually go and straddle the horizon here. Okay, so the horizon is sitting there. This is a black string horizon, and this is not very surprising from my point of view because what it really does is that the RT surface associated with the entire boundary of a large global ADS black hole is its event horizon. So this is something that we know. So essentially, the point is that if you don't anchor anything at the boundary then of course the RT surface is going to straddle the horizon and that's what they're finding. Here. So the interpretation of that is of course the question in some sense. So this is the statement that the, so the, so the way they, they interpret the statement is that the fully fine grained page curve of the combined system plus bath is a constant as opposed to the slight shaped page curve that emerges if one computes the entanglement entropy of just the system. So note that for a, so the page curve that I showed you earlier was for an evaporating black hole, which is why it goes up and comes down. But if you have an eternal black hole, what happens is that this, uh, the page curve is, uh, it rises up and then saturates. Um, and that's something that you expect in uh, unitary systems. Okay, so, and this fine-grained result is a version of David's observation from uh, long ago that the exact observables of quantum gravity are holographic and therefore have no support in the bulk, which has been emphasized by these authors as well, some of who are probably in the audience. Okay, so uh, in the second half of the paper, which is the part that, uh, I, I, you know, so which is a part is kind of what we are interested in some sense. Uh, it consists of, uh, considers RT surface anchored to the defect of the vertex of the wedge, which means 
you are going to look at, so this is an example of a RT surface angle at the vertex of a wedge. wedge. So uh, where gravity is not dynamical. So the key point there is that because now, you know, the, the vertex is at the asymptotic boundary of ADS, note that that's really the only point in this, uh, in this wedge geometry, which is at the asymptotic region. This is the only asymptotic point here. So everything else is uh, inside the bulk. So, and uh, so at the vertex of the wedge, where gravity is not dynamical, and when they do this, they find a page curve which has an information paradox thanks to this uh, Mathur Hartman Maldasena surface. So what I mean by that is these, you know, so this, if you look at this, there's a red curve here, and these red curves start from the anchoring point and go and cut the horizon. And if it cuts the horizon, it's bad news, and it means that you're generating an information paradox because as the time goes by, the you know there's a piece of this uh, this surface that goes through the horizon into the other asymptotic region, and its a length is always going to keep steadily increasing, and that's usually taken as an indication of the information paradox. Instead of like as I was saying, it should actually rise up and saturate, but instead it should keep rising and rising and rising, and that's not a good thing. So so those are those surfaces are what I'm calling the Mathur Hartman models in a surface. Um, and I'm, 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 you know, so usually sometimes I call Hartman models in a surface, but I think that Mathur had these papers on these nice slices, which is exactly the same idea long, ago, long before that. So uh, that gets resolved by an island. And the authors argue that the emergence of this slight shaped unitarity compatible page curve here is a consequence of the fact that there is a tensor factorization the dual def defects here. Okay, so that's reasonable. So you have in the wedge, the, there is a natural organization of the degrees of freedom of this, uh, this defect CFT. And uh, there is a, so because, and this tensor factorization is what is responsible for this, so for the this shape of the page curve is what they argue. So, but the implied idea here seems to be that because of this, the fact that we find a page curve, one sees this way, is not of particular interest for understanding the unitarity of black hole evaporation. This is the part where we may, uh, Surat may disagree with me, but I think that it is a very, um, uh, you know, very conservative reading of their paper. This is the impression I got. The implied idea here seems to be that the page curve one sees this way is of not particular interest for understanding the unitarity of black hole evaporation, uh, precisely because if you have a tensor factorization and degrees of freedom are moving from one tensor factor to the other, you would of course always lead to a unitarity compatible page curve. So what is the big deal? So that's the impression I got from reading their paper. So, but if Surat disagrees, he, he can- No, no, that's uh, accurate. I, 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 you could have okay. said it more clearly. That's, that's an accurate uh, impression. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so our view, so our view on the other hand is a bit different. So, uh, both in the non-gravitational bath cases considered previously as well as here, the existence of the legitimate of a legitimate information paradox is, I find, the crucial point of interest. Because we did not get the slight shaped page curve in this case. They did not get the slight shaped page curve in this case without actually running into an information paradox first, in the sense that you actually had this MHM surface, this Mathur Hartman Maldasena surface, which cuts this uh, horizon and whose area is always going to relentlessly increase. So you did not get the, the conventional page curve in a non-dramatic way. And I think that is a very significant point. And the existence of a legitimate information paradox is a crucial point of interest. And adding the bath to a black hole, in my opinion, exposes this paradox, but adding the bath to an ordinary quantum system does not. So this is a strong suggestion that the bath and the associated tensor factorization are not what you know, contributes to the, is not the only thing that is happening here in some sense. And there is a substantive amount of physics in the fact that we are working with a black hole and you're coupling this, uh, you know, so, so yeah, so that's the, so there's a strong suggestion that the bath and the associated tensor factors are largely just a crutch here and the physics is merely being exposed when you do this. So. So from this point of view, the new feature about this paper is that it's simply that the bath also has a holographic dual description. And uh, oh, sorry, note that whether there exists an appropriate radial tensor. So this is, I'm not yet saying anything about the existence of an appropriate radial, approximate radial tensor factorization, say flat space quantum gravity. I think this is a more conservative statement. Uh, so the claim is that the answer to the last of, la, latter question, so the, the question of whether there exists approximate radial tensor factorization in flat space quantum gravity, I think the answer to that question is also yes, and I will try to sort of defend it partially in the next couple of slides as well. But I think that this statement is already something, you know, is, is something of an interesting observation that uh, there exists an information paradox and we have seen an information paradox even in this context. So, so yeah, so-, right. so Just what, to understand what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, is your point just that, you know, we see a phase transition between two, you know, page curve kind of goes up and kind of comes down. 
and that mm -hmm. corresponds to a, to a phase transition between two RT surfaces. And if the second RT surface had not existed, you would have run into a paradox because you would have found something growing. So, I mean, is that is that the point that? Uh, yeah, that, I'm basically saying that uh, I'm basically saying that you know. So this statement, the so the fact that you know. I, I, I think that you should have been surprised by the fact that there, there was a there was a information paradox here before you could resolve it. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying that I see. here. So I'm saying that like you know I agree with you that the tensor factorization, the defect CFT, it explains the page curve, the correct shape of the page curve. I agree with you. But I'm saying that the fact that you did not get that correct shape of the page curve uh, without actually running into an information paradox first, I think is a non-trivial fact. That's what I'm so saying. So the paradox you're referring to is just the fact that there's one uh, RT sorry, surface. Sorry, can you repeat? Growing. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Again, sorry, the wow. paragraph you're the, the paradox you're referring to is just the fact that there's one RT surface which keeps growing, and mm -hmm. and so at some point it gets defeated by another RT surface. But I think Correct. that whenever you were to compute, if you compute, you know, even maybe in the absence of black holes, also a page curve. This is probably how how you would compute this, right? If you could find some setup where you had. I mean, it's hard to get so, microscopic so entropy. So, are you saying that there can yeah. exist a there can exist an information paradox without a black hole? Well, uh, okay, so maybe it would not be. An, yeah, you're right. So, uh, maybe you can't get microscopic entropy without without a black hole. So, it's probably, yeah. So, it's I hard, think there is a. So, so yeah, maybe, I think that yeah. it will be an interesting question if we can actually come up with that. So, because I think the fact that there is a black hole in the bulk is crucial for this. That's the. Yeah, I agree. Really I mean, there's that. a geometric feature that we're exploring, which is this length of these nice slices, which go, which extend exactly. into the interior. And exactly. you're right that, that that appears in all of these things. So I, I agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the so the so the paper with Kaushik that I will just mention now, which is where this plot was from, is uh, is basically what we try to do is we kind of put these results in some sort of perspective by actually looking not just at uh, these Neumann boundary uh, conditions for these uh, RT surfaces, but also we consider the possibility that you can anchor, um, you know, by you know, so anchor uh, these RT surfaces on on one, um, you know, one end of these things. So what I mean by that is, let me show these pictures here. So here, for instance, what we are doing here is these are Dirichlet boundary conditions. Okay, so what we are doing is we have we are considering the possibility that RT surfaces can exist, which have. Uh, Dirichlet boundary conditions here, 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 et cetera. And so note that these are gravitating regions. Unlike this point here, these are gravitating regions. So, and so in some sense, this, whether we can actually put a Dirichlet condition here is questionable. So we'll adopt the point of your philosophy that um, they are a valid uh, solutions of the equations of motion in the sense that they are the variational principle is satisfied and the boundary terms are all kosher. So that's the philosophy that we'll adopt. But to completely defend whether you know you can uh, localize an object in uh, in a gravitating region is of course the center of the debate in some sense. So I won't have much to say about it. So I will view this as as adding circumstantial evidence that that is a legitimate thing to do, but not as some kind of a proof that one can do it. Okay. So uh, what what we'll do is so so the first motivation for trying these Dirichlet boundary conditions is that it is technical. It is a, there's a technical motivation, which is, as I said, that they are perfectly valid boundary conditions for the boundary terms arising from the variation problem for the, for the brain world action. So, and the second motivation is philosophic, and this is what really uh, has me interested, which is that ruling out RT surfaces anchored to a gravitating bath is unsatisfactory in my opinion when done by fiat. So instead, well, what I would propose is that it would be more instructive to allow Dirichlet as candidate boundary conditions a priori and explicitly check whether they allow solutions and whether they have natural limit where gravity decouples from the angle. And, uh, and note that we do have such a limit here. So if you go all the way to the boundary here, you see that gravity has decoupled. So we have a very natural limiting process that you can see here. So, and that's the reason why we were interested in this. So if a, such a limit exists and the physics is very different in that limit, then I would be, believe that it is a strong argument that weakly gravitating anchors are fundamentally different from non-gravitating ones as far as the information paradox is considered. But in this paper, we found that the Richelieu solutions actually do exist and that they do have natural non-gravitating limit when, the, when we slide the anchoring location all the way to the defect. Okay, so that's what I so, mean by this picture here. Can, yeah. can I just say something? When you say Dirichlet solutions, you just mean you're going to fix one of the endpoints of the RT surface? Exactly. I see. So we yeah. were aware of this observation. I mean, that of course, if you fix the endpoint, then you'll get get islands. But you know, the reason we we had we had was that in this setup where you fix one of the endpoints, as you have in this figure, uh, you're treating the left and the right asymmetrically. You know, on the right, you're you're presumably yeah. going to use Neumann boundary conditions, 
And right. on the, so I'm on just, the left, yeah, you're going to use Neumann, and on the left, on the right, you use Dirichlet. But why is that a good thing when both are? So I think it is partly because I kind of view this as a way of separating the graph. You know, ultimately, in order to define some form of an entanglement entropy, we need to actually split the system into two halves. So the question is whether there exists uh, some natural way of doing it in a gravitating system. So that's the thing that I was sort of my my motivation. So the question of like you know so. It, it, my view on this is that uh, anchoring this here is essentially the equivalent of somehow splitting the gravitating degrees of freedom. And of course, there's an experimental calculation. It is not that we have no magical way of, uh, you know, saying what is the, where are the precise degrees of freedom. But the fact that it, it, it to me, what this means is that the degrees of freedom here on this side and the degrees of freedom on here on this side are entangled with, with each other in the gravity in the weakly gravitating system. That's why not anchor it on the other side as well. I mean, let's say you take both the systems well. to have the same graph. So well. you could put we Dirichlet on both sides. have a very sides. detailed uh, the phenomenology of these curves in the in the paper. I'm just sh showing you the the simplest version of it. So this is in some right. sense enough to make my point. But that is like yeah, we have a detailed phenomenology of these curves in this thing, and I would say that they are all consistent with the general impression that once you you know, so if you are close enough to the the weakly gravitating limit, they are all consistent with this picture that it behaves essentially like no gravity. So okay, let me just, yeah, I, I agree with you. And as I said, we, I mean, this is something which we discussed that, you know, if you anchor things, and of course, you expect to get back the same, the same island thing. But the question is, why is this something that makes sense? I don't think, I mean, we were, it's, I think you, uh, so why is this something that's a well-defined quantity to do? You know, you're saying the intuition that you're presenting is that you expect to have some local observables. And so you should be able to fix these, these quantities. I, I'm the saying quantity that, that you're computing is a, is a very fine grain quantity. And so, you know, these kinds of things which work for like I, I would, I low point correlators. I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say that it is fully fine grain. I wouldn't say that it is fully fine grain. I would say that it is uh, approximately fine grain. So, because if I take it all the way to infinity, then I think it is fully fine grain. But if I'm staying here, it is not fully fine grain. But what so, is it? Can, can you define what this quantity is in the dual yeah, so, theory or something? So, so, so it is, so, you know, one way to look at it, so maybe you can ask this in another two or three slides. So I think I'm almost through with this thing. And I think that you, then you asked again, I think it will kind of, at least my perspective on this will be a bit more clearer. So, uh, where was I? Yeah. So, uh, so we found that, yeah, so these solutions exist. And then we found that the island physics is identical on a weakly gravitating anchor as it is on a non-gravitating one, which is basically just a statement that I said, which is that if you slide your anchor all the way to the, the vertex of the defect, you end up finding that uh, you have no, uh, you know, so you, you, the, the structure of the curves remain invariant. It doesn't change. So the island physics, everything remains as it is, as you can see. So the, all the, the Hartmann models in a surface, et cetera, everything is always there. And the relative areas and all of those, the physics also remains intact. So this gives us a natural context to understand the slide shape page curves of uh, this paper as well, because it's a sort of a limiting case of this calculation. And uh, so also I want to emphasize that throughout our calculations, the graviton is massless. It's a complete, in a completely controlled setting, which I think is uh, also worth emphasizing. Because in my previous paper, even though the graviton was massless, I could not find, because the brain world uh, uh, solutions could not be constructed, I only could argue that there was uh, these RT surfaces, and I could also argue that the co-moving entanglement entropy had the right behavior. So those are the only two things I could argue. But here, on the other hand, we have everything that is completely computable, and you find that this thing uh, works out in the same way. Okay, so and that's in the, in the context of the massless graviton. Okay. So, uh, so yeah, so these comments here, I think uh, at this stage, I think after uh, these two slides, I think uh, uh, Subrat can ask his question again. So general comments before, uh, sorry. Ah, uh, yeah, general comments before moving on to the, the rest of the talk, which is about this uh, ergodicity business. So, so, so one way in which I think of this display prescription here is in terms of a doubly holographic analog of this uh, Gibbons Hawking idea of fixing field values at the cutoff. So, that's the that's one that's one of the reasons why I was motivated to try this, and because it also played a role in this uh, you know the not doubly holographic setting that we had looked at and also in this review by Maldacena. So and there also this you know the central dogma that they talk about is essentially a form uh, is a version of uh, you can think of it as a roughly speaking a Gibbons Hawking type of uh, idea where you put this cutoff and so on. So one way to motivate that a non-trivial page curve. So this is, I think, uh, a partial answer, a heuristic answer to the question that Surat is asking. One way to motivate that a non-trivial page curve and exist in flat space is to start with the usual near horizon limit argument for the ADS safety correspondence. 
And the uh, near horizon limit is a low energy limit. And by taking it, we are actually decoupling the brain or black hole degrees of freedom from those in the asymptotic region. So, but it is believed that the system admits holographic descriptions both before and after the limit. And that's a crucial point. So, because before we are living in flat space and we believe that flat space quantum gravity is holography. So, I mean, maybe more, it is more speculative in some sense than what we know about ADS CFT. But on the other hand, I think none of the people here would really disagree with me that uh, we believe that flat space quantum gravity is holographic. And the after description is also uh, holographic because that's just the usual ADS CFT correspondence. Okay, so you would start with the black hole in flat space, you took the near horizon limit, and then essentially you are taking a low energy limit and just looking at stuff close to the black hole, and you have a holographic description there. But before that, also you have a, because you are living in flat space and gravity is there and so on, you expect that the system is again holographic. And the fact that there exists a holographic description even after the near horizon limit is what I think is crucial for this island mechanism. This enables us to view stepping back from the near horizon limit. So instead of going all the way to the near horizon limit, uh, you know, what you can do is you can kind of think of as the near horizon limit is being weakly coupled to the degrees of freedom that you are, that you kind of, that you decoupled before you uh, went to the, uh, the near horizon limit. And that's in many ways analogous to this coupling, this holographic system to a sink in the same spirit that Pennington and company have done that. So the island prescription invokes the known locality associated to the holography in the after description coupled to a bath. That's the, that's the point of view that I'm taking. So while the fully fine-grained constant page curve is in the before description, which is in the flat space holography. So note that there are two separate notions of known locality and holography at work here, which is why even though the island is a known local thing, I don't, I don't think there is a sharp contradiction in it. So, and I think at this stage, I think Surat can ask his question because I think uh, that's all I really have to say about that. Yeah, no, my, my question is just, is there a precise description of what, is there a precise, at least, yeah, guess for no, what no, is being no, I don't, no, I don't have a precise description of uh, what, so essentially the question that you're asking is, uh, you know, is the question of, um, um, is the question of, uh, uh, you know, how uh, information is localized in, uh, in, in gravity. So that's, it's really like, a, it's really, so, so, so the, the zero thought answer is that the, all the information can be found at infinity, but I think that there exists some intermediate answers which are interesting, which is to do with, uh, you know, which is, has to do with the fact that the holographic direction feels for many purposes like an ordinary space-time coordinate. And I think that that fact should not be underestimated. So, uh, yeah, so that's, I mean, so, that, so what I'm doing is in some sense building circumstantial evidence. Not, I'm not trying to provide a proof. I'm trying to, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to build circumstantial evidence by doing some, what I would call well-motivated calculations, which actually do seem to have this uh, property that you can go to a limit where gravity decouples and it somehow retains the same physics that one has uh, when the anchor was, uh, you know, non gravity right. and, so, and do I understand correctly in all the calculations you presented, you just, it's just a bulk geometric calculation in that you, 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 you as in this case. Yeah. So, yeah. So that, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, no, I agree with you. It, it's possible there's something that, that could be being computed, but I just want to say one thing which I think might add to this. Article. You know, for instance, yeah. in this paper we wrote with Chanamuli and Olga and so on, one of the points we made was if you just look at MK ADS mm -hmm. and just look at perturbative effective field theory in gravity, these constraints are already important for telling you even at low energies, you know, gravity localizes information unusually. Uh, yeah. For instance, if you wanted, if you just look at the vacuum, you know, people talk about entanglement in the vacuum. But in yeah. gravity, in the presence of the vacuum, you know, the entanglement, you know, you can see you're in the vacuum just from outside by measuring the energy from far away. No, I have and no that, beef with that. I have no beef with that. And I think that that is perfectly reasonable. I mean, I think the, you know, so roughly speaking, um, you know, so, so, so for instance, if you just have, uh, you know, so if you, if you just have, you know, just the Hamiltonian constraint together with the fact that, you know, if you're on a quantum theory of measuring correlation functions, I think you basically have a holography. There is, uh, this is, I think there is some old paper by, uh, I, I think, uh, I think probably Giddings or somebody where I have seen similar comments. So, and it's no, no, Giddings always doesn't very possible. Giddings doesn't agree with this. This, this, is, this, is something we, this is something we say, but I don't think Giddings says it. Uh, Giddings, Giddings has a different... Uh, uh, okay, so maybe he, I'm... He thinks uh, you can have yeah. split states and so on, yeah. Yeah, so but I think yeah, I, yeah, I agree maybe, with maybe, maybe you yeah. told me, maybe you told yeah. me, I don't remember exactly, yeah, but yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. So, so anyway, but that seems, that's, I mean, you know, so the idea that like, you know, the Hamiltonian constraint is basically, uh, yeah, I mean, it just seems like, 
that already contains gravity and the wheeler levitt equation you know all of those things so it all of, already contains holography in some somehow in my view so uh, so that i have no beef with and then you know it's all fine fine okay thank you okay so um so i think this yeah so so the so now we go on to the sort of the main part of the talk and uh, so main part in the sense of the, uh, the the paper with the the vaishnav so and uh, so the reason i wanted to kind of emphasize this part is largely because this is the thing on which i was actually invited to give the talk but then on the other hand we put out this other paper after that then it seemed like maybe it is kind of at least interesting for some people to talk a little bit about that so okay so um, so yeah so now it's a complete change in shifting in gear in some sense because uh, now we are going to talk about this question of ensembles and uh, semi classical approximation that seems to play a crucial role in all this discussions about the page curve um in these uh, in in these recent developments so 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 if you have anybody you know like if uh, you can stretch your legs etc this is just completely decoupled from the previous talk and this is you will be completely you should be okay so so okay so anyway so the the key point is that there exists so again i will give a brief qualitative summary of what the sort of the background is first and before going into our calculation so the idea here is that the the island prescription there can one can motivate it using semi classical path integral calculations in uh, of varying uh, you know in 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 gravitating systems so by gravitating systems i basically mean that uh, there are toy models like jt gravity where you can compute the n per any entropy using the euclidean path integral and then you can show that uh, you can reproduce this island prescription and the phase transition by uh, by this euclidean approach to um, uh integral entropy and linear entropy so this is i'll just state that as a fact and um this calculation can be explicitly done in simple theories like in 1 plus 1 dimensions and we find the page curve and this was done by uh, uh, uh various people uh, and i'll cite some references eventually but i think i forgot to mention some of them so um and jt gravity is a rare case of a fully well defined calculable metric path integral Okay, so this is what makes JT gravity interesting, and I'll say some disadvantages of JT gravity also. But for the moment, I'll just focus on the advantage, which is that it is a one plus one dimensional theory, and unlike in higher dimensions where the Euclidean path integral often comes with these uncontrolled uh, negative kinetic terms in the conformal mode and all that, in JT gravity in one plus one dimensions, the integral is perfectly doable. It's a straightforward path integral. So these results, while resulting in the page curve, are puzzling. and so the first one is sometimes presented as a puzzle but i don't think it's really a puzzle so but the second one is i think it is uh, it's worth understanding a little bit so the first one is that we are able to compute the page curve in the semi classical metric based description of gravity and we do, we do not seem to need the full microscopic degrees of freedom which are presumably holographic for that you expect for gravity okay so you can just do the semi classical metric based calculation and you get the uh, the the page curve this is possibly surprising because you know entanglement entropy is often claimed to be a fine grain quantity and um, if you are if you are looking at a fine grain quantity it is not clear that your uh, um you know so if, if it is a, if it is a fine grain quantity it would be surprising that a coarse grain description like a semi classical metric calculation would be able to reveal it but this is in in hindsight i would say that this is not a such a surprise and the reason is that even though the entanglement entropy is a fine grain quantity it only contains one number as opposed to the density matrix which is uh you know some matrix a density matrix is a huge amount of information but the entanglement entropy itself is just one number so perhaps it is not surprising so much or so at least not a contradiction that semi classical calculation can compute so and that seems to be the attitude that most people are taking these days so but the second question the second question is the structure of the result that these uh this jt gravity calculations have and uh, i mean i'm not going to tell you why exactly because it is too much of a digression for me so but uh, you can actually uh, see that the the form of the results that you get from this calculation has the uh, has the has the features of an ensemble average so it is very natural to interpret the results of these path integral calculations in terms as viewed as an ensemble average and this ensemble averaging seems surprising when looked at from a when we are since we started out by looking for a unitarity comparable page curve so if you had a theory that you started with and you did the calculation you know unitary theory that you started with you would have probably not expected to see an ensemble to play a major role i will qualify that statement i mean there is it's not very surprising that you would see it as i was argue um so but nonetheless it is a, you know if you are seeing an ensemble average it behooves us in some sense to try and understand why is it that 
we are running into an ensemble, even though our entire goal from the get-go was to start with the unitary theory and get a unitary patient. Okay, so, so you can ask a question here about this ensemble, sure. please. Uh, this may, this is actually just a re remedial question for me. So I thought mm -hmm. if you just take uh, so in the in this model that the people from Stanford have, uh, you take this, uh, uh, you put an end to the world brain. There's some clear argument that you have to have an ensemble because yeah. there's some factorization problem. Uh, if you don't yeah. have such an end of the world brain, is there a clear argument that you, you know, the answers you're getting are consistent only with an ensemble? If you look at, for um, instance, this Almeri Maldusena, Hartman, Path Integral, why is yeah, it? I mean, I why do we even yeah, need so, an ensemble think, for that? I I think that so. So I my calculation here, for instance, would suggest that there should be because I think that in in semi classical calculations where, uh, um, you know. Um, where you're sort of uh, looking at, so yeah, so okay, so let me first say that there is the only calculation that I know where there is this is kind of done in a completely legitimate way is the paper that you mentioned by you know Pennington, Schenker, Stanford, Yang, and there definitely there is the ensemble emerges very clearly, but I think that in the higher dimensional cases etc. I don't think there are very concrete um, well, at least. There have been a lot of papers in the recent past which actually do a lot of things which are close by to this, and I have not kept track of all of them very closely. But so I don't want to make a very strong statement. But my feeling is that the ensemble is fairly robust feature. Yeah, let me just say that. Yeah. What is the argument for the ensemble in general? I mean, if you if you, yeah. I think it is just coming from the fact that you're computing. You know, when you the the entanglement entropy is there is a psi i psi j uh, expectation value is what you get. If you look at uh, one piece, and then if you, I mean, you have to write the uh, a couple of things down. But if if you if you compute, no, I know uh, the argument that you're mentioning in this Pennington Stanford chunk. Yeah. So and but that structure but, seems fairly robust, right? I mean, it's not. No, like, but they have uh, something very unusual that's also happening there. So, so, as I said, the unusual thing that they have is that you know the Feynman rules are that you do the path integral in gravity, and then you add on this additional decoupled braid. and maybe yeah. that's a well-defined thing to do in two dimensions. You know, you have these uh, two-dimensional. Uh, uh, you know, wild Peterson modelized spaces of uh, yeah. hyperbolic, uh, met, you know, metrics bordered with geodesics. Uh, but the, the, the ensemble is coming from the fact that this brain. So, but I think, but I, I think that, so to make the bare statement about ensemble, you don't have to do the calculations in a fancy way. So you just have to look at, for instance, you can just compute the second Rennie entropy. And already at the level of the second Rennie entropy, you can see that. So what you're talking about is really trying to compute the, you know, the analytic continuation for, for the, really the, the, the you know, okay. the, this thing and all that. Even at the very basic level, just if you compute the, uh, you know, the entanglement uh, for the, sorry, the density matrix and the, uh, uh, what is it, the second Rennie entropy. If you already at that level, you can see that the ensemble is very natural. Okay. So yeah, so I think it's just a, it's a very basic structural thing that just happens because of the fact that you're adding this, uh, this replica wormholes. It's uh, yeah, that's yeah. So that I really don't have much to say about that. I haven't really looked at it in the in higher dimensional case. I think there have been some papers with Balasubramanian and company. They may talk about it. So, but I have not really paid attention to them much. So, yeah. Okay. So, um, so yeah. So, so the the point. So the thing that I wanted to say was that in in fact, JT gravity can be written very explicitly as a sum over an ensemble of matrix models. So this is just an explicit variable change, and uh, it's an exact expression. You can do everything very explicitly. And uh, and so the question is so 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 the point here is that JT gravity even uh, you know so the price that you pay for making JT gravity a well-defined metric path integral is that it explicitly comes as an ensemble average over uh, many theories many unitary theories so and this may I don't it, so the question is whether uh, how much of that can one can lift to higher dimensions for instance if you're interested in let's say something like n equal four super angles or something like that where if you have a thermalized state you would expect that to be dual to a black hole. So uh, you you would you would like to have uh, you know an understanding uh, of uh, black hole physics in a setting where the you are not just looking at ensembles of theories and uh, you know so at least if if you take the point of view that n equal four triangles is a perfectly well defined single standalone theory which should have a quantum gravity dual to it then you I would think that it is you should have an understanding of these uh, things in, uh, in in a in a single uh, realization of the theory. Okay, so that's the statement. And in, it is difficult to answer these puzzles directly because the precise connection between the full quantum gravity, that is the CFT, and the semi-classical metric-based description is one of the least understood aspects of the area CFT correspondence. So of course you can you know, take uh, bulk things and take their boundary limits and find the map between um, you know, ADS and CFT. 
but it is uh, so starting with the CFT variables and just deriving a metric like description, uh, you know, is not something that we have really been able to do in ADCFT. CFT. So in order to get some, at least in, um, you know, in the higher dimensional interest equations. So in order to get some insight on this, we'll ask this question. Are there any non-gravitational unitary systems where we can see the unitarity compatible page curve semi-classical, where ensemble averaging plays a crucial role? So the idea is that, so the two keywords are semi-classically and ensemble averaging. And the, and the thing that we are trading off is that we are not going to worry about gravitational systems. We are just going to look at non-gravitational systems. Okay. And if you can find such a system, then we can have reasonable confidence that the true quantum gravity is unitary and that the ensemble averaging is an effective feature of the semi-classical approximation. That'll be our motivation. And the reason why we think it is reasonable to do this is because uh, the question we wish to answer is the origin of the ensemble average semi-classical page curve. And this is a priori nothing to do with horizons of the information variables. Okay, we want to see the, the, a page curve emerging from a semi-classical description after an ensemble average. That is, we want to go step are as far back from the fundamental unitary description as possible and still get the page curve. And uh, it, whether we can do that is the question that we are sort of interested in. And this in principle is independent of the horizons, the existence of horizons or gravity or information paradox or things like that. So that's the reason why if we can do that here, maybe that also applies to gravitational systems is the philosophy. Okay, so we can hope to gain some insight on this problem by studying a non-gravitational system. And the non-gravitational systems that I will take on are the ones which are, uh, which, uh, which, you know, in which we can expect to see ensembles play a role semi-classically. And a possible guess is a, our systems which are quantum chaotic. Okay, so the reason is that we expect quantum chaotic systems to exhibit thermalization via what is known as eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. And I'll take a very specific um, version of the ETH. I mean, I won't need, well, I mean, ETH is, you know, it has a, yeah, I mean, ETH is basically the statement that if you compute expectation values of small operators and high-lying states in chaotic systems, quantum chaotic systems, then they basically the expectation values look thermal. That's the way in which usually the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis is presented. But the way in which I will introduce it is actually a, based on an old paper of uh, Threadnicki where he uh, first wrote, first used uh, this thing called Berry's conjecture. And uh, I will explain what Berry's conjecture is momentarily. And he used that as a motivation for arriving at the, the more conventional version of uh, the ETH. So, so, I mean, I should also say that uh, I gave a talk on this in uh, Israel a couple of weeks ago, and I was told that the ETH was not just, uh, so I, I, I often credit it to Sretniki and uh, uh, Jamie Deutsch, but uh, there is also a paper by, uh, I think it was, uh, who was the author? So there, there, is, there is an Israeli, um, ah, now I can't remember the name. I forgot to put the reference again here. So I'm again, I'm again failing the original author of ETH here. So, but hopefully it'll come back to me. I'll remind you at the end. So, uh, so, but yeah, so, uh, so almost 10 years before uh, both Sretniki and Doish, there was actually a paper uh, where the ETH idea had come up before. And uh, yeah, so anyway, so we consider a hard sphere gas. We are going to work with a specific hard sphere gas leaking slowly from a small box into a bigger box. And this is believed to be a quantum chaotic system. So this is the toy model that I will use in order to kind of, uh, uh, to, to, in order to motivate the emergence of semi-classical ensemble averaging in a quantum chaotic system and get the structures that we expect to see in the black hole here. Okay, so, um, so yeah, so, so, so by slow leak, so the system that you're considering is, so we want to make it as, close at least in some sort of uh, you know, uh, analogy way to a black hole. And so what we want to do is we want to take a small block box and we want to take a large box and the two are connected by a small hole. Uh, and the idea is that to make the leakage slow, what we will do is we will tune the sizes of the hard spheres and the sizes of the, and the size of the hole. And they are kind of, uh, you know, this is only marginally smaller than this. So, which means that your system will um, you know, it will take a while. So if you have, if you start with uh, the, the left box, the small box being full of uh, hard spheres, it will take a while for it to leak out to the other box. And the key point is that the second guy, so this hierarchy here is just for, a conf uh, for uh, doing calculations, because if you, uh, you also need the assumption that the density of the gas is sufficiently slow, sufficiently low so that we can actually incorporate. 
Threatniki's technology to do our calculation. So we, what we will do is we will use Threatniki's methodology for doing these uh, calculations using Berry's conjecture in order to compute these uh, approximate equilibrium um, uh, results. And in order to do that, we need a low density approximation. And that's what the second hierarchy, this, uh, this hierarchy is doing. So in order to ensure the slow leak, we have this. And the, in order to make things calculable, we have this. So, and this mean free path, this thing is, you can just look it up on Wikipedia. Um, so yeah, so uh, we will also assume that we are working with sufficiently high energy so that Berry's conjecture applies. This is just a statement that ETH really holds for high enough uh, you know, states, high energy states. And the precise details of much of what I'm saying here really does not matter so much. All that we really need is that the system is calculable and that we have a slow leak so that we have the notion of an epoch as the gas leaks out from one box to the other. And as time goes by, the number of particles is changing um, uh, gradually. And we'll compute the nth Rene entropy of the reduced density matrix of the bigger box at each epoch. Okay, so this is what we are going to do. And Berry's conjecture, and we will use Berry's conjecture to do that calculation. So Berry's conjecture says that eigenfunctions can be treated as Gaussian random variables. And it is, uh, yeah, so this comment is some, some uh, a natural caveat for many of the statements about ETH. Um, and roughly speaking, you have to be looking at some sort of macroscopic kind of things. So Threatniki showed that this is equivalent to ETH. The assumption of Berry's conjecture that the eigenfunctions can be treated as Gaussian random variables is equivalent to ETH. A very, um, so his technology is what we will use. And, uh, uh, and also, the, the, there is also some papers by Jamie Doish on ETH at the, at the same time, and also 10 years before all of these papers, there was this paper whose uh, name I still cannot coming to me. So uh, actually, let me take one quick second to figure out the name. So it's, I'm sorry for this thing, because I think that should be given, I think it's given. So it's a Rabinovich emailed me saying some things about my talk and saying that this is so. Yeah, so it's Asher Perez. Okay, so Asher Perez, can you hear me? My internet connection may have been a little bit shaky. Yeah, we can hear, we can hear. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, we can hear, there's some, uh, there's some uh, slight so there disturbance so in the, the Okay. Um, yeah, so just let me know if there is a problem and uh, I can switch Wi-Fi. So yeah, so, so the Sretniki, Doish, and Asher Perez were the people who started this ETH business. And uh, so what I will need is very specific realization of this uh, Berry's conjecture, which is basically that if you're looking at high energy eigenstates, so this is, this is essentially all I will need. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to compute this uh, Rene entropies. And when I compute these Rene entropies, the eigenstate of the system will play a very crucial role. And it will effectively, you will see in the next couple of slides that these, there will be products of states that will show up in my uh, Rene entropy calculation. And this, uh, uh, this so the, so the, so, and, and Rene, and uh, uh, Berry's conjecture, what it really lets me do is that whenever there are multiple copies of these, uh, uh, these wave functions that show up, I can replace them by a weak counteraction. That's what it really lets me do. And these weak contractions, the two-point functions are known, so I can explicitly finish my calculation. That's what makes it interesting. So, and note that these are all wave functions. I mean, you should not think of them as correlation functions or anything. These are just wave functions of the hard sphere gas. And uh, this is just a weak contraction. So, weak contraction of the wave function, but uh, so this is just from coming from Gaussian. So, and this EE stands for the fact that I'm replacing my wave functions by the Berry's ensemble replacement. Okay, so we will be interested in computing the entanglement entropy of the bigger box to which the gas is leaking. And we will take the full state to be some psi, and where at each epoch we can make a split of the coordinate into those of particles in the small box X and those of in the large box Y. So which means that my uh, density matrix, so this is the full density matrix, is of this form, where psi XY is psi star XY, so times psi star X, y, X prime Y prime. And, um, and so when I'm computing, as a warm up of the entanglement entropy calculation, we'll compute the second Rene entropy. And I can, I'll basically just talk about the second Rene entropy, the more details you can find in our paper. So the key idea is that if I want to compute the second Rene entropy, I will basically run into products of this form. So you can forget about most of these equations. The only thing that you have to keep track of is that uh, 
the trace of row square has this many products of this wave function showing up. And that's the place where I will replace it with uh, these uh, very conjecture replacement of these big contractions that I talked about. Okay, so that's the main step. So that's the main place where that's that's the place in which uh, um, uh, Rennie's uh, so uh, very very conjecture goes in. So and now the key point. So the, here's the key point in some sense, which is that at each epoch, which means that at each epoch there is a you know I can make a semi-classical approximation. Note that the wave function of the complete system is some arbitrary superposition of particles living there plus some particle living there. There's a general state that sums over everything. So that's just a complete chaos. Can't do anything with that. So but if by the making the assumption of uh, an approximate equilibrium or an approximate epoch in which I have some ns number of particles on one side and some nl number of particles on the other side, I actually get to make a major simplification to my state. So, and this as this equation that I've written here is what I will call my semi-classical approximation. And the basic idea is that I can expand the general state at each epoch in terms of a linear combination of eigenstates living on the left guy and eigenstates living on the right guy. And these are both separate eigenstates of the left box and the right box. And this linear combination will be my candidate state during each epoch. So this is the this is a crucial input. And this is the place where in my, uh, uh, in this hard sphere gas calculation, the semi-classical approximation going in. So in principle, note that the particles can be anywhere and anywhere. And that's, uh, that's, that's a fully quantum state is just completely messy. So, and note that this is an expansion in the eigenstates of each subsystem. And that makes things significantly easier for us. I mean, again, this is, uh, I'm just computing this at this stage, you know, this expression, you don't have to really pay attention to. All I'm saying is that I'm plugging it into the previous expression that I had here, this form of this, then I get some form. And from this stage onwards, everything is calculable because all of these expressions are expressions for um, the, the Berry's conjecture that applies to single boxes, which, have been, which can be worked out in great detail. So again, so and as a result, I can compute my uh, reduced uh, then sec, you know, second Rennie entropy. Here I'm writing it for the second Rennie entropy, but we can also do it for all the higher ones. And uh, what you find is that you get a certain expression of this form. And the crucial thing here is that everything now is calculable. Because it so is just I, a I, I, I got confused about something. Um, I think maybe I lost. So you can ask a question here? Yeah. Yeah, I, I got yeah. confused about something. Uh, sure. Usually to, to compute like the, the trace of row squared, you would need to keep track of exponentially small corrections mm -hmm. in some very careful way, right? Which the ETH would not allow you to do. No? Uh, maybe I yes. just misunderstanding something. So how, how when you say it's computable, sorry, could you please explain a little bit um, once again why it's computable? Why is trace of row squared computable? Uh, all, all I'm saying is that, so, you know, so I all I'm saying here is that if you have a wave, you know, uh, for this particular state, if I assume that I have some particular state uh, for my uh, so so so, you, it, so there you know when you say something like that, what you really mean is that you don't know the state. You know you're not you've not specified the state in some sense. So I mean, here what I'm saying is that I have a very specific state that I'm looking at, which is based on my pre, uh, prejudice about what the uh, you know, the state of the system looks like at each epoch. So I have a prejudice for it. And that prejudice is what I have put in here. So once I have that, this is just a direct calculation. That's all I'm saying. I see, but so it's here, very like, sensitive to that, that this prejudice, is, you know, right? Isn't the answer uh, correct. just yeah, to say? Yeah. So, it, but I mean, that is basically the assumption that, that's basically the assumption that the state is in equilibrium at each epoch, uh, you know, uh, um, a, a local equilibrium at each epoch, yes. I see, but just to say, yes, but if, that's if for instance, approach. yeah, yeah, but if for instance, you know, if I if I take take like this room and I compute trace, I of think the thing that you might be concerned about, yeah, I, I think I think I can probably add. So I think what um, what I am trying to reproduce is merely the shape of the page curve. So in order to really say whether the uh, approximate semi-classical state is really how good a descriptor of the pure microscopic state is the thing that you are concerned about. No, I'm no, not I, really I'm not. I'm, not, that I'm happy with the I'm, all shape I'm really of the page curve. Is that, yeah, uh, I've had, let, let's just so consider for instance case, this room. It should be fine, right? Because mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Let me say. So you know, if you compute, if this room were, were in a pure state, then trace of row square would be one. But if this room was in a thermal state, the trace of row square would be right. you know, something much much smaller than that. And 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 that and this this issue is something that yeah. is a very fine grained piece of information, right? I mean, maybe the magic in gravity is that you can do some computation in gravity that allows you to compute something much more fine-grained on the boundary. 
But in a non-gravitational system, I don't even see how, unless you make some very specific assumption about the state, one can even compute something like trace of rho squared. I mean, I agree, if you give me a state, I'll, I can compute it. But it's extremely sensitive to e to the minus s yes, corrections. But, but again, I mean, you're, you're asking a Right. Right. But I'm saying that those e to the minus s corrections are as well as it can, I can reproduce the page curve. So I'm, I'm what I'm trying to do is that the sh can I reproduce the shape of the page curve is what I'm really talking about. I'm not really talking about how good a descriptor of the microstate this system is. This is that I think is a separate question. I'm no, I'm asking, asking the same question all. about the. So about what the page I'm curves. saying here is that uh, I, I'm not asking. I'm just yeah, saying the if, whether trace of rho squared is one uh, or not is is depends on uh, these exponentially small directions. Uh, I must be missing something in what so, you're but saying. But the trace of rho square here, I can choose it to be. Um, um, I'm, I'm not really seeing this. So here, for instance, I mean, you know, this the state here is uh, it's a perfect normalizable state. If I can, if I, I can choose it to be perfectly normal. This is essentially the same structure, by the way, as the same uh, states that uh, 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 you know Pennington and Shankar and. Stanford and Yang have very roughly speaking. So uh, because they're also they kind of factorize the system into two pieces, and then you have uh, just, you know uh, the, the things corresponding to the okay. uh, the radiation part, and then there is also this black hole state piece. So it's a bit like okay. that. So it is somehow inspired by the same sort of thing. So uh, I guess what you're saying is that this is a semi class. That's why I'm emphasizing that this is a semi classical definition of the state. It is not a um, it is not supposed to, to what extent, and this is a question that I've also not really fully understood, even in the case of uh, all these black hole calculations, that how, how well do these semi-classical states capture the true state is not very clear to me. But I think they are good for keeping track of the shape of the page curve. And that's the same approach that I'm taking here, so to speak. So because I think in that- the like Stanford the Shankar Yang, uh, Yang calculation, you know, they, they have some, they have these end of the world brains and there's an exact delta ij for those end of the world brains. No, right. it's not delta ij plus e to the minus s. It's exactly right. delta ij. Uh, yeah, and, the, and, and that's the part of the that reason why it's an ensemble. IJ. Yeah, I, exactly. But it, the fact that yeah. it's delta ij and there is no e to the minus s term is actually important. If you were to add like e to the minus s there, then you mm -hmm. know even that th those calculations would not be valid. So somehow you must be making a similar assumption about some something exact in in this computation. Otherwise, it how. How would so I think that so so, so so I think th that's basically the same reason. So that's basically the same thing as making these ensemble replacements. So these ensemble replacements that I'm doing there are precisely the analog of that. So when I do this calculation here, and you know, at each epoch when I am making this, I am not taking these states to be, uh, you know, I'm not taking the states to be exactly, you know, I'm not taking the precise value of the states or anything, right? I'm basically what I'm doing is I'm computing this trace row L square, and the object that I'm getting. Is is being evaluated in the uh, uh, in the very ensemble. That's the way I'm calculating. Okay. Okay. Fine. Thank you. Yeah. So, and I think that that's uh, I would strongly suspect that what you're saying would actually be morally equivalent to that. So that would be my answer for now, anyway. So, th thank you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, so anyway, so the point here is that so I mean you can ignore most of these expressions because the talk has already dragged on for quite a while. I sorry, Chetan, I, I, I can't hear or see you. Hi, Vishal, are you there? Or? Yeah, I, I think he got disconnected. Oh, he just got disconnected. Mm -hmm. Let's try
Vishal, there's some way of contacting him or something, or you have, you have uh, messaged him or? Yeah, yeah, I've just mailed him. Okay. Yeah, so my Wi-Fi had some issues, sorry. Okay, so uh, can you see the screen? Yeah, yeah, we can see that. Yeah. So let, let me just... Uh, yeah, so... Yeah, so all I want you to pay attention to is just these two terms here, which are connected to the the entire, you know, the reduced density matrices of the large and the small box. And uh, so the point of this is that, so I'll go a little quickly. I think that, uh, so, you know, so the people are already kind of tired, probably half of them have gone. So existence of the epoch, epoch time scale allows us to use Berry's conjecture in evaluating the reduced density matrix of the bigger box at each epoch. And when plotted against epoch, this leads directly to a page turn. So, and uh, I'll just note that, you know, there this, this term, so the key point, is that I'll be I'll be quite quick now. So, um, but yeah, if you have questions, of course, I can answer. But so this uh, this so the key point is that in the early part of this page curve, this object is the dominant quantity, and at the late part of the page curve, this quantity is the dominant quantity. And the trade-off between them, we can basically get uh, page curve is the basic punchline. And there is a natural um, you know transition time, which is the page time, which you can uh, obtain from there. And uh, so this, this expression, so that as you can see in the early parts, the expression is basically the thermodynamic entropy of the larger box as the number of particles keeps increasing. And uh, in the later half, you basically find that uh, this, uh, the, 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 the corresponding quantity is the thermodynamic uh, entropy of the smaller box, okay? So, and so, yeah, so, and this last result is some sort of expected in some sense, because if you, uh, if you wait for systems to completely thermalize, uh, the smaller subsystem typically will have the, the entanglement entropy of the smaller, of, one, the, of either subsystem will be the thermodynamic entropy of the smaller system. So this is a fact that is known on general grounds. So, uh, yeah, so let me skip all this. So, yeah, so I'll just say, so, yeah, so, so the only thing that I kind of want to say at the end is basically uh, is that this calculation, so by just explicitly looking at it, so I didn't really emphasize too much the, um, you know, the higher Rennie entropies and so on. I just talked talk to you about the second Rennie entropy, but you can do it for various ends, et cetera. And this is a, the thing I want to emphasize that this page curve that we are finding here is a direct calculation. So many of the page curves that you see in uh, related settings is oftentimes quasi uh, heuristic or schematic or whatever. Some of them are legitimate page curves, but this one for instance, this is every single point that we have here is a legitimate calculation and you can actually see that it turns around. And uh, the numbers that I have here are the epoch numbers. These are some huge, um, you know, uh, numbers which I can explain if need be, but it's really the structure is very straightforward. Uh, the early part gets nominated from the trace row LIL and the other guy gets their contribution. The later half gets trace row SIS and where it saturates here is the thermodynamic entropy, the smaller box as one should expect. So now the interesting thing here is that this uh, remarkably, what actually we can do is that we can look at this calculation um, but here, what we did is we computed the entanglement entropy. You know, I computed an entanglement entropy or any entropy, and then computed that in each epoch. I computed it um, in the in the appropriate uh, Berry's ensemble. But instead of that, I can actually compute the Berry's uh, ensemble average at the level of the reduced density matrix itself, and then compute the corresponding Rennie entropy or the entanglement entropy. And then what I find is that I only get the first term. So basically just this term. So this is the only thing that contributes to my, uh, um, to my uh, entanglement entropy. And you see that that will relentlessly keep increasing. And this is an interesting fact because it shows that if instead of working with the entanglement entropy of the 
of the dense of the reduced in, 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 instead of working with the ensemble average of the entanglement entropy, if you work with the, uh, the ensemble average of the state and compute its entanglement entropy, you actually find an information pattern. So in some sense, it may it is kind of tempting to think that this is what is happening even in the case of uh, black holes. So uh, that's one, uh, let's say, uh, you know, an expression that we can explicitly find in this case. And that's really all I wanted to say. So this last 10, five, five, 10 slides are a little fast, but uh, I think I have really overshot my time. So, um, so yeah, so the punchline is that this, uh, so if you compute entanglement entropies using this ensemble average thing, you find the precise page curve. But if you do the ensemble averaging at the level of the state and then compute the entanglement entropy, then you end up finding that it is uh, a relentlessly rising quantity. So, and this was, this sort of a suggestion was made previously by Busso uh, in a related context. And what we have is an explicit realization of it. And I think that's kind of an interesting one. Okay. So, uh, so I think that I'm really done with the technical part of my talk. So I'm just going to kind of summarize the punchline of this second half of this talk. And those who are decoupled, hopefully this will kind of give you a general story. So, uh, so some key observations about the calculation is that the ensemble average for Berry's ensemble is key for getting the result. And the existence of epoch was crucial for us to use Berry's ensemble. And another interesting thing that we find is that note that the ensemble was epoch dependent because the number of particles that are on each uh, box at each epoch is actually changing with time. So uh, note also that our ca calculation is semi-classical. I emphasize the place where I put in the sort of the semi-classical assumption. And on, in general, Berry's conjecture is supposed to be sort of a semi-classical statement in, for many purposes. And even though I did not emphasize it, the detailed structure of our calculation can actually be organized in a way that is reminiscent of large and diagrammatics. You can see it in our paper. And it has structural similarities to the way the replica wormhole calculation gets organized in JT gravity. And even more directly, there is a paper by Hong Liu and his student where they look at some uh, related settings where they compute any entropies of general equilibrated systems. And they're also very similar diagrammatics emerges. So in fact, our calculation is very similar to what they have in this paper, even more so than this paper. So, um, so the key point in some sense, the punchline that I would take away is that our calculation uh, worked with an underlying unitary theory. And yet the presence of quasi equilibrium epochs led to an ensemble average at the semi-classical level and the page curve. And the main takeaways for quantum gravity would be that an ensemble average semi-classical page curve can be found in single realizations of quantum theories. And the ensemble can emerge as an effective ergodic proxy for a time average during each quasi-equilibrium epoch. So that's the interpretation that I would take. And um, yeah, so this, um, yeah, so in, in that sense, uh, ne these need not be, the ensemble and the semi-classical uh, 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 origin of these things need not be related to the mysteries of gravity or the information paradox. Yeah, so this is essentially why I already said that. Uh, note that the time scale at which Hawking temperature for black hole changes is very long, which is why it makes sense to define Hawking temperature for an evaporating black hole. And that's the same reason why we have like the slow leakage approximation in our problem. Uh, and our proposal disagrees with what may be an explicit ensemble interpretation proposed by some authors. I mean, I'm crediting Busso here, but his paper is, I would not say that it's sufficiently clearly stated what he means by a gravity ensemble duality. So uh, I, uh, you know, so it's, uh, he has enough wriggle room to interpret it both ways. So, but I would say that the, if, if, if the interpretation is what seems to be being said there, I think our proposal disagrees with that, which is that, um, um, you know, an explicit ensemble average is always necessary for gravity seems a bit much to me. Uh, but it provides an understanding of the semi-classical page curve in single realizations of more realistic unitary theories. Example in the string duel of n equals four super angles. Uh, and not just in toy ensemble averages over unitary theories. And uh, that's the place where I'll stop. Thank you. Sorry for going over time. Thanks, Chetan, for that wonderful talk. Thank you. If anyone has any questions for Chetan. I see that some of the collaborators are in the audience. Hi. So uh, you made a statement about how this semi-classical approximation was needed, right? Which is which is that you assumed a factorized system. Uh, sorry, say that again. So uh, it's at some point you were emphasizing the semi-classical approximation, which is that you assumed a factorized system. Yeah. But uh, yeah. I, I'm slightly confused. Like you could have a very uh, conjecture for like the whole bipartite box, 
and yeah. even and you could probably do the calculation with the uh, with the uh, with the ensemble average for those states, right? And uh, would you would you still get this? Um, so, so let me try to interpret the question. So, uh, so what you're asking is, um, so for it, for example, um, uh, say say say, say start say start with the Benny state where like the particles are all in, all in one box, mm -hmm. and then at at at, at the end, yeah, I would, I would expect that uh, uh, maybe like the state would evolve to the uh, state for the bipartite box because particles. Uh, uh, I guess yeah, so. But I mean, that's the setup in which I'm working, right? I mean, yeah. Uh, so I, I could. I, I'm just asking if I if I work with a naive uh, various transats of a superposure of these kind of states, where the particles are in a in a box and particles are in the bipartite mix uh, are equally spread over two boxes. Would I still land on a? Uh, I'm not. A, completely, and, um, I'm not completely understanding what your question. So, um, so here. So for instance, this this is the main assumption that we are making about the system in some sense. That's the way I'm looking at it. So, um, so you are asking whether the full psi could be viewed as some kind of uh, uh, and and provided I can come up with a Berry's conjecture for the full psi. Yeah. So I, I so yeah. So that's an interesting question in some sense because you know. So I think that actually there is a slight generalization of the Berry's conjecture which might apply to all uh, macroscopic uh, local equilibrium states. Which what I mean by that is that. You know, let's say that there exists a, a quantum state which has an interpretation as a, a macroscopic smoothly varying. It has an interpretation of that form. Let's say there is some, you know, there is some sort of semi-classical, approximately local equilibrium kind of a macroscopic interpretation that state has. If 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 such a state exists, I think that that state would actually also satisfy. Uh, Berry's conjecture in the sense that it will also do this Gaussian factorization. That's what I think. I think that is what you're trying to get at the thing. And, and then would you be able to get the page curve with, uh, without assuming this factorization there? Um, so so the, for the, in order to get the page curve, I really need to have like two pieces, right? Here I'm trying to really do a page curve for a completely ordinary quantum system, which is like I have one, system, one piece here and one piece here. And I want to move my degrees of freedom from one to the other. So if I if if I do not look at tensor factors, I'll never get a page curve. So that is just yeah. I, I I see that like you you're choosing one piece at one point and another piece at the other point. I was just yeah. asking so, like uh, if I could do away with that. And uh, I mean, I mean in some is, sense, I could I do away with the semi class what you call as a semi classical approximation. Uh, so that factorization is not so much to do with the semi-classicality. I would say that it has to do with the fact that you need to split the system into two pieces if you want to see the page curve. So that's what it is about. So, uh, and I think that if you could do away with the split of the system into two pieces in this, you know, in this, note that this is a completely normal quantum mechanical system in a sense. It's just no gravity, no holography, nothing. So, and there, if I don't do a split, it just, it's just automatically, I mean, the, the page curve is not even formulated, right? So that's the sense in which you really need a uh, factorization there, yeah. So, but I think the, your uh, earlier question, which I think is an interesting question, and I uh, did think about a little bit about it, which is that, um, um, you know, this, uh, so, so the question of, so I think that the statement about uh, Berry's conjecture uh, is usually phrased in terms of eigenstates, but I think there is a slightly stronger statement that one can make for any quantum mechanical state, which has a, uh, ma macroscopic bulk local equilibrium interpretation, semi-classically, or semi-classically, or you know, which has a macroscopic interpretation, then I think that state can also be replaced by uh, Gaussian ensemble states. I strongly suspect that that is the case, even though I have not seen a statement of that kind in uh, the literature. Probably, if uh, Vaishnav is there in the audience, maybe he has some comments. But I think because we had some discussions about this. Or maybe he doesn't want to say anything. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, so that's that's all I have to say about that. But yeah, that's a good question. Okay, any more questions? Okay, if not, that's thanks, Chetan, once again. And uh, yeah. thank you. See you guys next time. Thanks, Chetan. Thank you.